Hello and welcome to I'm Alan Sigurd of Navitar and I'm really excited about today's presentation. Scott Holly of Harkin Capital is with us. Scott is talking about fundraising, how emerging managers become emerging leaders. And he should know, the team at Harkin has raised more than $4 billion for their clients. Just last week they celebrated another fund close. Congratulations, Scott. Thank you very much, Alan, and it's uh, good to be on with you again. Hey, we're glad to have you. Also with us today is Navitar's co-founder and COO, Caton Konkar. Caton's role in this is to show us how you can deploy technology to streamline and help achieve the goals that, Fre that Scott is talking about today. Scott, let's start off by having you tell us a little bit about Harkin. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate that, Alan. Uh, Harkin Capital is a, a private equity placement agent. We work with what we call emerging leaders in the venture capital and private equity buyout space. Uh, we work with funds generally south of $500 million. We've done uh, work with funds uh, as small as $100 million and lower. Uh, we do both full mandate and top off assignments. In addition, we have a, a secondary practice that has been growing in recent years where we take on both buy side and sell side mandates of private equity portfolios, both fund positions as well as individual assets, direct secondaries. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much Harkin in a, nut, in a nutshell. So, um, Alan, would it make sense for me to just go ahead and jump right in then? Yeah, let's go ahead. Okay, super. So uh, what I'd like to do to start off is just give a little bit of background about what we're seeing in the market today. Uh, as Alan mentioned, we did just have a close on a, on a fund uh, where we had a celebration last week. Um, and so we're, we're really trying to focus right now on what's going on today. And, and this is a question that we get quite a bit is, is it a good time to fundraise? Obviously, uh, you can't really market time a fundraise, but I think it is important to have a sense of really where things are in the market before you go, go ahead and launch. So this slide that we have up right now uh, has some information about what investors are really looking at and what their appetite is. Uh, and what you can see is that if you're raising a small to mid-market buyout fund or a, or a VC fund, that you're really at the top of uh, limited partners wish list. And that's a, that's a great thing for most groups who are starting out um, because most of the deal flow that we see is in this space, the small to mid-market buyout as well as the VC space. Let's go ahead on to the next slide. Uh, we really think of this as uh, you can see at the top of the screen as the golden age of fun fundraising, um, especially for these smaller managers. I showed on the previous slide how small buyout funds are, are on everyone's wish list. And really what's driving that is the intense competition that we've seen really over the last five years from the larger firms where this divergence of value, uh, enterprise value entry multiples uh, has, has really stayed pretty strong. And what we really love about, about these smaller firms is you just have that added element of value creation if you're able to grow a company and get that expansion uh, on the multiple when you exit. So on, let's go ahead on to the next slide then. What we're really seeing is that smaller funds are gaining an increasing share of limited partner dollars. What's happened coming out of the Great Recession is, as limited partners have said, you know, we, we, we recognize that smaller firms have more tools at their disposal for value creation we see that there's better alignment generally on incentives uh, because of uh, the, the dependence on uh, the carry stream as opposed to the fee stream for, for generating and creating personal wealth. We've seen that limited partners have come into smaller funds in a pretty dramatic way. And the, the difference from uh, pre-2008 and post-2008 is that larger limited partners who previously would say, you know, we, we can't really afford to be, for instance, $50 million in a, a $200 million fund and we don't want that type of concentration, are now saying we want to have fewer managers, we want to have access to smaller funds, and because of that, if we find a, a manager in the 200 to $250 million range that we have conviction around, uh, we're, we're okay taking that concentration risk. Uh, and so because of that, we do see that more 
uh, an increasing share of uh, limited partner dollars are going into smaller funds, which is which is great news for for Harkin and great news for the groups that Harkin works with and seeks to work, work with. So let's go ahead on to the next slide. Again, the, the areas of focus uh, in 2015 and what we're seeing uh, for 2016 as well, mid-market buyout, small buyout, growth capital, which is increasingly viewed as a separate and distinct area uh, within private equity, is, is also top of the list. And on the strategic side, limited partners are really looking for those funds where it's operationally focused, where we have a buy and build strategy in play. Uh, as well as where there's uh, an opportunity to generate uh, returns through some type of restructuring and turnaround. So uh, on to the next slide. This is, this is uh, a little bit of the, I guess, what you could call the bad news for, for small and emerging managers. The rec there's a record number of choices out there. It seems that however fast limited partner appetite expands, the number of available choices is expanding at an even greater rate. And so what that means is uh, however uh, unique or differentiated uh, your particular offering is, the odds, odds are that there's someone out there who has some type of offering that fills a similar need from a limited partner's perspective, if not from more of a market-facing perspective. Uh, and the odds are that they've, they've already beaten a path to the limited partner store. Uh, the, the amount of, of information and meetings that limited partners have to, to sift through to find that uh, that small manager that's worth taking a bet on is huge. And the, the real difficulty, especially for first-time funds as well as even second-time funds, is just getting their attention. And so because of that, we can see on this next slide uh, that the outcomes from a fundraising perspective, it's really a tale of two cities. Uh, there's the average time to close has increased uh, from pre-recession, but that average belies some statistics on the right, which is for some groups, they're getting it done very quickly, and for other groups, it's taking quite a bit longer uh, in time. And Harkin's been involved in fundraises that uh, are less than six months. We've also been involved in fundraises that are greater than 24 months. Uh, and I can tell you, and I'm sure it goes without saying that most of the folks listening to this as well would much rather be occupying that, that left side of the graph than the right side of the graph. Um, so really what we're talking about today is some tactics and strategies to hopefully uh, accelerate that time to close even if you are uh, a, a newer manager without that same level of brand recognition within the limited partner community. So on the next slide, uh, we do hear this a lot, that uh, the speedy fundraises, that those are, are pretty much just the must-have groups. Those West Coast tech VCs who are on Roman numeral 10 who have had uh, oversubscribed fundraises for the past 20, 30 years, um, those are the groups that, that have those uh, less than six months uh, to close. And that's, that's actually not, not entirely the case. We've actually seen groups that we've worked with that are emerging managers or emerging leaders on their first or second time fundraise where they are able to get those, those uh, from start to finish from publishing the PPM to that final close uh, in, in under six months. Um, now obviously there's a lot that, has to, that goes into play and market dynamics certainly um, is part of that. But what I'd like to spend the bulk of the time discussing today on this webinar uh, are different strategies and tactics that really any manager can uh, employ to be able to have um, experiences where you're at least accelerating the timing of that, uh, of your fundraise from, from what it would be outside of employing some of these strategies and tactics. So let's go ahead on to the next slide then. Um, and start talking about how you set the, that stage uh, from Harkin's perspective for a successful raise. I have to put in this, this slide, as I call it, the motherhood and apple pie slides, slide. The funds that we've seen that have successful raises, not surprisingly, they have good returns. They have a differentiated strategy. And by the way, we, we always tell our clients to, uh, to not use the term unique. Um, we've had enough fund formation councils that have uh, beat that into our heads. Um, 
that, that we're really talking about a differentiated strategy. Having existing investors. Um, now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you've got a $100 million uh, marquee name anchor, but if you have good return, you should have uh, folks in the background in your, in your past histories for whom you've, you've, uh, you've generated some returns. Possibly even uh, management teams that you've worked with uh, where you've been able to generate returns. Um, and then having a large general partner commitment. If, no, no fund that we've seen has uh, all, all five of these elements in sterling fashion. There's, there's always uh, degrees. Um, it's not yes or no on, on any of these things really. Um, so if, if you're looking at the slide and, and saying something like, well, gosh, you know, my, I, I've got good returns, but I just, you know, my partner and I have only done a single deal together as a fundless sponsor, uh, or, or, you know, I've got a great team, we've lifted out uh, of our previous shop and we've worked together for, fi for 15 years, but uh, the economics were closely held at the last place, so I can't really afford a large general partner commit commitment. Uh, or, you know, we, we've got a differentiated approach, but we're a lower mid-market buyout fund, and so, you know, we, we might look a lot alike the other groups. If those things are going through your mind, um, you know, don't worry about that. Uh, well, I, I shouldn't say don't worry about that, but I should say that's normal, and we've never seen an offering where there hasn't been some element of uh, having to work around issues on, on really all five of these, these points. But fundamentally, fundraising tactics there at the bottom, fundraising tactics can't fix inherent deficiencies in the offering. But understanding what those deficiencies are, I'd say, as a corollary, is a key part of, of having a smooth fundraise. So let's go ahead and go on to the next slide then and talk a little bit about uh, setting the stage uh, for a successful fundraise. So to the first point here, the first bullet point, know, know thyself. Uh, invariably, when we have um, a first conversation with a prospective manager and then we really dig in, uh, a couple of things happen. Uh, one, um, we, we obviously uncover during due diligence things that are uh, uh, our potential um, concerns uh, from a limited partner's perspective and, and therefore potential concerns for Harkin to take on a mandate. That's not too surprising. But what is surprising is we'll be three or four reference calls in and for instance a, uh, a former CEO will say something to the effect of, you know, uh, within the first 30 days they were able to um, really help us develop uh, 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 a sales strategy for the uh, reseller channel. Um, and make three introductions and put us on a new sales trajectory. Um, and, you know, we go back to the manager and say something like, you know, wow, we had a great reference call. They said that you did this for, uh, for them, and they say, oh, yeah, we did that. And we'll say, why wasn't that in the slide deck? And why didn't, you know, why am I only hearing about it now? This is great. We need to really make this uh, uh, more of a selling feature in, in your presentation and your materials. So, being if you're if you're going about the fundraise by yourself, um, you know, seek the feedback from anyone that you can, um, from from folks that you've worked with, from uh, other general partners, even if they're not in your niche. Um, get the feedback uh, on your offering. To the second point, developing world class marketing and fund materials. This is uh, you know we're we're in 2016. Uh, desktop publishing is. Uh, um, a readily available skill, um, and this is something that we we see uh, that folks really uh, should invest the time to create those materials that that a limited partner would get and say, you know, this is this is a best these are best in class materials. Um, you know, they may still uh, have issues with other parts of the the presentation, but. But don't don't shoot yourself in the foot by having um, you know something that that looks like it was uh, uh, a canned um, PowerPoint template that you found on on the internet. To the third point, drawing a line between past and present. Uh, 
your model needs to be seen as repeatable and the earlier in your uh, firm life that your fund is, this is even more crucial. We like to talk about uh, uh, a well-known East Coast uh, endowment um, CIO or head of uh, private equity who we, we would take uh, first-time fund managers to see this person and they would say something to the effect of, you know, they'd flip to the uh, return slide and say, gosh, you guys generated great returns and I always get these managers coming in here with fund ones who have great returns and then I invest in them and I don't get anywhere near those type of returns. What gives? Um, and it was said a little bit tongue in cheek, but there is a, an important underlying point, which is your model needs to be seen as repeatable, drawing that line between past and present. It's not just about the sectors that you invest in or the size of companies but really how you execute your business. What we like to do at Harkin is we like to dissect the entire value creation chain from identifying sectors and sourcing uh, all the way through closing transactions, structuring transactions, um, and then all the way through uh, to exit. And what that does is that creates then a template that we can then go into the case studies of what they've done before and what their strategy is going forward and if there's a deal that's in the pipeline uh, or uh, a deal that they're, they have recently closed but haven't executed the, fir the full value creation um, process on, we can still draw that line so folks know what they're getting and have a sense that uh, they, there are fewer unknowns um, about that, that first time fund. Uh, a common concern of first-time funds is strategy drift, and so this is a key key element of really helping limited partners, even if they're not directly asking questions about are you going to have strategy drift, that they have a better sense that they know what they're getting uh, if they sign up for your first-time fund. To the next point, getting the believers on board. Uh, a broad fundraise without the believers is a recipe for a long fundraise. So what do I mean by the believer, getting the believers on board? Uh, as I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, ideally this would be an anchor investor uh, that has some brand recognition within the limited partner community and who has invested with you previously. That's not always feasible and we understand that. Um, and sometimes what we've seen is uh, a, a small close uh, with general partner commit, maybe one or two smaller institutional investors, and then a very long list of uh, CEO types, of advisors, of other industry individuals, where you may have uh, you know, the average check size well under uh, institutional minimums of uh, you know, just a few hundred thousand dollars um, per, per investor. Having those believers on board, though, is the reason that they're important is beyond just the, the capital, um, they uh, are, are a much more credible, um, uh, they're a much more credible individual uh, to have on your side if they've actually made that commitment. Secondly, first-time funds have uh, an additional concern which is as a first-time fund, um, uh, a fund manager still has some um, optionality about whether they're actually going to move forward with it. Until you've had that first close, even if you're renting office space, uh, limited partners are going to have that concern of, you know, are they testing the waters? Are they looking for, for jobs with other firms? How serious and committed are they to this? If they see that you've had a close, even if it's a smaller close, with individuals that you've generated returns for over time, that concern is then taken off the table. So to the next bullet point, having that highly targeted investor list ready to go in Navitar. And so Navitar was actually the first um, tech purchase that we had as a firm uh, after I, I joined the firm uh, five years ago. Spent a lot of time up front really gathering all of our information that resided in other CRMs and in spreadsheets and beginning to have a repository of information and the first thing that we do uh, as Harkin professionals when we get into the office is open up our browser 
uh, and our Navitar screen is there ready for us. When we bring on a new fundraise, what we're able to do is we're able to rely upon that embedded institutional knowledge of from the limited partner's view and from the general partner's view. So what does that mean? Let's say that we bring on a new fund that has some similarities either in size or in sector to a group that we've worked with previously. Or sometimes it's just the, the second serial fundraise, uh, as was the case of the fund that we, we closed on recently. It was the second serial fundraise of a group that we've worked with uh, for their first time fund. We're able to prepare a targeted investor list based off of all of that embedded information so that we can, we can have a list ready to go literally within uh, just a few minutes where we're quickly filtering in and filtering out names that are likely candidates versus uh, names that aren't likely candidates. And I'll talk a little bit more on the next slide about how we use Navitar during the fundraise. But getting that set up, Navitar has been a huge, huge help to us in, in having that targeted investor list ready to go. Oh, and one thing I should, should mention about that uh, is that a couple of the groups that we're working with, uh, or a couple of the um, uh, uh, information sources that all of you work with uh, for information, uh, so the pay databases, they all now build in um, uh, plugins that, that fit right into Navitar, so you can actually have updated information right there on your screen from uh, Prequin and PitchBook uh, within your um, within your Navitar fields, and that's been that's been a really cool feature. Then to this last point of setting the stage, projecting out the portfolio events. Um, how will the firm develop in the eyes of the LPs during the raise? This allows. Uh, if, if either your placement agent or you as a marketer uh, of your own fund to be able to do a couple of things. One, if you have a meeting and you're able to lay out uh, uh, several events that are going to happen in the future, we're going to bring on a business development professional. We're going to close on one of these three pipeline deals. We're going to exit this company that we had, uh, that we had done as fundless sponsors or with our previous firm and you're able to, to lay out those events and then during the fundraise uh, actually execute on those, it does two things. One, it gives um, limited partners the confidence that uh, you're going to be able to follow through with what you say you're going to be able to do in your pitch. Secondly, it gives you an excuse for, uh, uh, and I shouldn't even say an excuse, but a valid reason for why you can maintain close contact with those limited partner investors. Too often what we've seen is uh, that a fund manager will uh, simply pick up the phone to call um, a prospect that they've met with previously uh, to basically ask them if they've done any more work. Um, and that can come across as being persistent and it can also come across as being nagging. The limited partners always enjoy uh, or, or generally enjoy getting a call where it's you know, here's a development that is pertinent for you in making your, your decision. So projecting out those portfolio events ahead of time and then layering in on top of it uh, a fundraise timeline uh, is helpful as well. So let's go on to the next slide then about uh, actually moving forward and executing the raise. So having that head start with, with the best prospects within your closest circle of believers, uh, that's really important. Um, you know, we've got uh, uh, so many hours in a day. Um, there's only so many limited partners that are out there. It really is worth that time, energy, and investment to understand where that that first circle is outside of those those folks that you know. That could either be referrals. Uh, let's say one of your believers is a a, a former uh, partner at a, a firm that you worked with previously. Uh, who, who is investing a small amount, that person's going to know some limited partner investors um, that, that they can make some introductions to. Um, let's say that one of your, your believers, even though they're committing a small amount, has a relationship with uh, a, an investment consultant. They should be putting you in front of their investment consultant as well. So getting that head start with the best prospects within the closest circle of believers. 
one of the reasons that we like working with small funds is that wherever you're starting from, if you get uh, a little bit of interest, um, you can you can move really quickly towards um, uh, uh, a conversation about allocation and scarcity, and that uh, once that that conversation really begins in earnest, that can be a great motivating factor for for limited partners who are facing that that wealth of options that we talked about uh, during the market se section. Second bullet point here: process, um, setting the goals and establishing the metrics. So at Harkin, we've uh, built and refined a sales funnel that, that works for us, that we do sometimes modify for, for clients, but we've, we've found that, that the, uh, the funnel system that we have in place is helpful. We have a report that is set up that we can instantly change um, to suit uh, the needs, desires of the clients, as well as the uh, stage of the fundraise. Um, so setting those goals, establishing the metrics, having those weekly meetings, even if you're not working with uh, a placement agent, if you're just doing it by yourself, uh, having that, um, that focus where uh, there's some accountability for a report out, um, and then tracking all of the interactions, uh, notes from calls, notes from meetings, et cetera. And Navitar can help with all of that. Um, third, having those high impact roadshows. Um, preparing, executing, and following through on the roadshows. Um, as placement agents, this is uh, you know, obviously one of the key things that we do is getting these meetings set. We like to think that um, our value is uh, on what happens before on the setup as well as then helping, assisting through the due diligence and, and closing process. But certainly, getting those meetings is is what it it's is a, is a key part of that race. So, what what does a high impact roadshow look like? Certainly, it looks like uh, one that's efficient, where you're having numerous meetings in cities and you're moving from city to city. But beyond that, it's making sure that you have uh, meetings with the right individuals, um, folks who are key to the the process. That doesn't always necessarily mean the CIO. We've had uh, clients or prospects who have, have have hoped that we would indicate something like we can put you right in front of the, the chief investment officer and just skip the whole upfront process. Um, I could, I would, from experience, I'd say even if that is a possible, even if there's groups out there that could help and do it in doing that, that that's not always the preferable process for a best outcome. Um, and then the follow through. If there were multiple people in a meeting, uh, sending those notes to all the individuals, listening for that follow-up, and uh, showing uh, to this next point the respect for the LP's process. Um, this is this is critical. Uh, prior to being um, a placement agent, I was a limited partner, so perhaps I have a little bit more of a sensitivity to to this point. But um, uh, very often, we at the end of a meeting, a limited partner will lay out a process. Um, something to the effect of give me two weeks because we have uh, travel to an annual meeting next week and then we'll, we'll convene with the team meeting the following week uh, on Monday and I should have some feedback for you on Tuesday. Um, I've delivered that message as a limited partner and then gotten a call 48 hours later uh, asking if I want a data room access. Respecting the LP's process is, is an important way uh, to make sure that you don't um, shoot yourself in the foot and and put a, a negative taste in someone's mouth when they when they do have uh, all of that choice out there in front of them. Um, and then to this this last point that I've spoken about before, having those appropriate follow-ups. It's always better to have a call which is we have some portfolio news, we have some uh, fundraising news, we have some team development news, as opposed to have you gone into the data room yet. It's just a better better conversation, one that is more likely to advance a dialogue. So finally, um, on I'd like to just talk a little bit about some considerations in selecting a third-party marketer. And Avatar did put out last week uh, that booklet on choosing a placement agent. Um, we were were happy to be be partners and and. Uh, giving some, some feedback and some elements that made it into that book. I think it's a great overview. 
let me just highlight a few of the, the, those points that, that were in that book as well as things that we've seen. Having recent experience with funds of similar size and strategy is important. Um, obviously, you don't want a group that has um, raised capital for your you know, most direct competitor, but someone who has uh, enough experience with fund sizes uh, that are similar to yours with uh, strategies that are similar to yours. If you are uh, um, an industry-focused buyout firm trying to raise $250 million, um, you don't want to be you know, the first sub-$500 million fund that, that your a placement agent has raised. Um, and the experience should be recent as well. The limited partner community uh, is, is constantly in motion. Um, individuals move shops. Shops change strategy, they change consultants, consultants change strategy. And so understanding that recent experience is helpful. Second, the ability to take both a general partner and limited partner view to your fundraise. So what this means is uh, obviously as a general partner, um, you want someone on your side who uh, has, has a little bit of experience uh, understanding what uh, being a general partner is all about. So understanding that when you're fundraising, you're still doing deals and you're still building a firm uh, and having respect for that process. If you're a first-time fund, um, someone who has been a general partner uh, is going to be um, uh, an advisor and probably in ways that you, you didn't anticipate as needs arise that are more related to firm building than they are strictly to fundraising. Um, and then importantly, having that general partner viewpoint is important to be able to then tra effectively translate your strategy and your differentiated characteristics to limited partners. The ability to take the limited partner view is also important. Um, there's, there can sometimes exist a gap between what the general partner, the information the general partner wants to uh, put forward versus the information that the limited partner cares to receive. Um, and having uh, a third-party marketer or placement firm who is able to understand that limited partner perspective is important. You have to realize that when you're coming in and talking about uh, a part of your business that you think is, is, is pretty cool and is pretty differentiated, you're talking to a limited partner who may have heard uh, a similar story three or four times that week. Um, and so understanding what, what those those hot button topics are or what those mantras are that limited partners hear and, and then become skeptical of uh, is something that a third party marketer can be very helpful with. Alignment of incentives. Um, you know, the one thing that I, I really love about our business is that it does naturally lend itself towards great alignments, uh, but there, there can be different bells and whistles on agreements where um, that alignment of incentives uh, can become strained. Fourth, uh, the bandwidth. Um, it's, it's always an appropriate question to ask uh, a potential placement firm how many uh, uh, engagements you have in the market now, how many do you expect to have um, going forward. And what you don't want to be is you don't want to be in a position where uh, a, a placement agent is picking up the phone and you're the fifth or sixth or seventh uh, topic of conversation uh, with that limited partner for pretty obvious reasons. First of all, they're busy and the odds that uh, your placement agent's only going to be able to get through one or two items of business um, is, is, is high. And then secondly, if you do end up being that fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh uh, item of, of conversation, the signal then to the limited partner about your, your relative importance is, uh, can be strained. Um, that said, there, there's, there's advantages uh, in terms of being able to, to stay close and stay relevant to limited partners of having multiple engagements. And um, certainly for groups who have a track record and history of getting it done for firms, uh, there can be some, some positive branding uh, knock-on effects that, that occur by having a group that, that is working with, with other firms as well. And then finally, conviction around the mandate. Um, it's closely related to bandwidth. You know that if a group only takes on a handful of assignments in a year, 
that they're going to be very um, thorough and, and exercise great due diligence and care about taking on a mandate. And so that conviction uh, is, is going to be there. Um, Harkin professionals uh, generally invest in each uh, group that, that, that they work with. Um, I just got back from an annual meeting where um, our team members had invested in the first time fund. The, the fund is performing well, uh, which is great, but we've also showed up at annual meetings where uh, things, things haven't been, been going as well because of whatever uh, you know, market conditions, etc. cetera. Um, and for us, we like to be able to have the limited partner community know that um, if, if you come into a fund that you're going to see the Harkin professionals uh, as investors at those annual meetings going forward. So that's, uh, that's about it. Um, that's you know, a few, few items of, of what I think uh, you should be thinking about, uh, selecting a third party marketer and then just some of our general thoughts about setting the stage and executing arrays in a way that can, can lead to success from a time frame perspective. So I think with that, I'll hand it back over to the Navitar team and uh, I'm not sure if we're going into questions next or if we're going into the, um, the demo, but uh, hand, it, hand it back over to you guys. Well, we, we uh, will be taking questions. Great. Um, uh, this has been great, Scott, by the way. Absolutely great. Uh, we'll take questions. Uh, I think first, while we wait for some of the questions to get entered in the uh, Navitar, uh, in the, in the GoToMeeting, webinar control panel on the right. Uh, let's go to Caton and have him show you how you can use technology to streamline some of the things that Scott was talking about to achieve your goals faster. Caton? Yeah. Thanks, Alan. And thanks, Scott, for the great overview. And I know that for obvious reasons, uh, you cannot share your system because of all your proprietary information. So what we thought we could do was just use a couple of minutes to kind of highlight some of the things that you had covered. You talked about kind of using the Navitar system to build your investor lists, lists maintaining profiles of those investors, uh, potentially kind of using external data sources to to augment and enrich their profiles, being able to manage the fundraising process, manage your pipeline, as well as kind of generating status reports for your clients. So again, I'll take a couple of minutes and I know there are a bunch of questions coming up, so kind of we'll keep this demo short. Uh, if anybody is interested in a full-scale demo, we'd be happy to take that uh, offline at a separate time. Uh, but kind of, uh, going back to the point that Scott had mentioned, it's it's important to be able to have your list of all your LPs. Right? So the system Scott is using <clears throat> allows their team to be able to create a list of LPs, to be able to classify these LPs, and for any given LP, if I go into the example, you can create a very robust profile you can start tracking kind of information about the LP and the, also the kinds of investments and the preferences in terms of the kinds of investments that they like to make. You can also augment this data by using any data sources. If, um, Scott mentioned PitchBook and Prequin and here's an example of, kind of how that feed can come directly into your system. So when you're looking at an LP profile you can see all the information directly from the data source and in this case coming in from Prequin. So this helps you in creating the right background and the right kind of information about any LP. You also are able to have a complete history of your entire relationship with that LP because again it could be like Scott mentioned in, in his example, it could be a follow-up fundraise, it could be kind of a new similar GP that you're talking to. All of that information will show up here and you can see for this given, for this LP, you've made pitches for these two GPs. 
So you can see all of that and obviously all their history, everything on the LP profile. And this helps you reach out and identify the right LP. So if kind of you're, you have a new client, you're helping them fundraise based on their focus areas, based on their strategy, you can leverage this information that you have about the LP and come up with a list in a, in a couple of minutes of the right LPs that you should be targeting. Uh, similarly for your GP, right? so all, all the, your clients, the GPs that you're representing, you will be able to create profiles, you'll be able to track details about all their funds, and most importantly, the pipeline where kind of you're reaching out, you're representing this GP, and you can easily now track all the different LPs and where they stand. And at any point, you can just click a button for a status report. Here's an example of one which kind of is dynamic, <clears throat> allows you to kind of put your own branding in the report. It's, it's like a sample report where I can go back to my client with where we stand in terms of my fundraise. So all of these kind of functions allow you to be more efficient. Uh, obviously, the Navitar system comes with a whole library of dashboards and reports that have already been designed for this process. So you can definitely use them right from, from the go. Or you can also customize and, and create any new, new reports that you feel are more appropriate for your specific processes. So we'll keep it at that from a demo perspective and go back to the slides. And I think, Alan, at this point, we can probably go into all the questions. All right. Thanks, Caden. So Scott mentioned eight questions that alternative asset fund managers must ask before hiring a placement agent. The ebook I just checked, and that ebook is now available for downloading at no charge, of course, on the navatargroup.com website. And you can read what Scott had to say there and what some other people are saying. We have a lot of questions. Uh, this is in from Eric Scott. Our family offices moving away from funds in favor of direct investing? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, and we, there's been a really interesting um, trend that's been going on and it's, uh, we'll see how that develops. But, but certainly this idea of, of disintermediation and trying to get more direct access to the alternative investment landscape has been uh, a theme uh, within family offices and uh, that's, that's been presented a few different ways. Um, certainly there are, uh, there are fundless sponsors out there who are now striking deals directly with family offices on a deal-by-deal -deal basis. There's family offices who have brought in uh, private equity pros in-house from, from firms and told them to go out and, and find deals and, and, and do deals. Uh, and then there's groups that have done, done hybrids where they continue to do some fund investing, but then also uh, are looking for co-invest opportunities as well as to source their own deals. Uh, what we've also seen though is that there's family offices who have gone down that path and then had some, some bad experiences and then uh, retreat back to more of a, uh, a fund investing model. So I, and then you have to couple that as well with uh, family offices who uh, are you know emerging new wealth that are just coming onto the alternative investing scene, uh, and and therefore you know if you're, you're talking about an expanding uh, um, pie or pool of capital within the family office landscape, so you can't really talk uh, explicitly about a decline in family office investing into funds, but certainly those things are in play. What we have seen work. We've seen some of our managers uh, use that to their advantage. Where uh, we had one um, client that we worked with who uh, did a fundless sponsor deal and brought uh, family offices into that deal directly, um, but they were then able to to actually uh, tie allocation in that deal to a commitment to a blind pool fund in the future. Um, so, so I think that that's it's good news for um, for first time fund. Uh, managers um, who you know may want to take advantage of some of that flexibility to do some deal by deal work 
um, outside of a traditional fundraise. But that absolutely is a trend that we're seeing where family offices are, are being a little bit more entrepreneurial uh, about how they access alternative investments. Scott Sean asks, what were the size of the must-have funds that closed in less than six months? Uh, I guess you're referring to the funds that, that we have on, on slide 10. Um, uh, the, the three last fundraisers that we've had of uh, the fund one and then the two fund twos, uh, those sizes are uh, 306 million, uh, 250 million, and 227 million, respectively. We have a question from Doug. Could you please touch on Harkin's capabilities and experience criteria in the private equity real estate sector, PERE? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I'll, we're always happy to, uh, to toot our own horn, so to speak. Uh, just kidding, uh, tongue in cheek on that. But uh, we, to be totally honest, we haven't done a lot in the real estate space. Um, we've looked at a lot, and that's an area of focus for us going forward. Um, we do have uh, experience in the real asset space more broadly. Uh, Fred Malloy, who's uh, one of the, the co-founders of Harkin, uh, was, was one of the original team members of Intervale Capital um, Oil Field Services Fund. Um, and generally speaking, within the limited partner community, the, it's the, it, the real asset um, coverage team has coverage over both real estate energy uh, as well as other natural resources. Um, so so the, the short answer is we don't have a lot of experience uh, in the real estate space, but that's that's definitely an, er an area that Harkin's been looking at. We've, we've probably evaluated about a dozen real estate uh, managers over the last year, and we're going to, uh, to continue to look to build capabilities there as well as uh, uh, evaluate um, opportunities to work with managers in that space. Catherine asks, when employing a marketer, do LP share due diligence, or will each want to exercise their own process? Uh, the, the answer is both, um, but le, le, well, let me just state first off, all limited partners do their own due diligence. Uh, there's not a single group out there that completely relies on our diligence, nor should they. Um, that said, uh, Harkin does limited partner style due diligence up front. And um, we are very clear with the limited partner community that we are representing the general partner, that we are uh, on there, that our, we have a fiduciary duty to uh, that general partner, that the general partner is paying uh, the commission um, th that uh, we will be paid on. But that said, any uh, third party market or any placement firm that wants to be in this business a long time is not going to take a an approach to a limited partner uh, where they're they're viewing um, uh, that situation as one off. Uh, and so, uh, what that means in in actuality is that you know on the Harkin side, we will have very frank conversations with limited partners about our views not only of the positives uh, of a uh, an offering, but also some of the drawbacks. And so a lot of times we'll have conversations that go something like, you know, maybe after a first or second meeting, the limited partner will call us up and say, hey, we really like it. Um, you know, tell me about uh, what your due diligence looked like, what your concerns were. And we'll say, well, you know, we were really drawn to these three things. Um, these two things were uh, a real concern of, of ours. And here's how we got comfortable with it. You know, we, we did these reference calls. We... Uh, dug into their pipeline. Um, we had a couple of, you know, heart-to-heart sit-down meetings, and then we've evaluated them since then on the road on these, on these other things. Um, in some situations, what we've actually done is we've uh, shared our reference call notes directly with um, limited partners, uh, and we never show, share those note, notes directly with the general partners. Um, because we, we tell the, the, ref, the people that we call when we do the references, we say you know, explicitly that, that they should feel free to speak freely because we won't, uh, we won't share that feedback with the person that we're, we're evaluating. Um, so there, there's a lot of different ways that um, uh, a placement firm, uh, including Harkin, 
can help and facilitate the limited partner uh, due diligence process in a way that um, you know adds uh, increases the likelihood of the the raise getting done, but then also helps uh, with the timing of the raise. We've got a question that I think I'll direct to Katen. Katen, are you still there? Uh, yes, I am. All right, great. Uh, this is a question from Sean. Does Navitar allow the GP advisor to track deals as well as investors? Oh, yeah, absolutely. For the GPs, we have a whole solution that uh, on one side they can manage all their investors and, and fundraising, but also at the same time manage their entire deal flow and sources and uh, portfolio companies. So, yes. Right, thank you. So, Sean, we've got several more questions, so uh, let's see if we can move through these quickly. Uh, are the investors you see trending toward income or total returns, asked Johan. Uh, that's a good question. I would say that there's, uh, there's not a, a clear-cut trend, um, and it tends to be more specific. That said, if you're talking about income as, as like yield plays, so for instance, senior debt, uh, credit strategies, mezzanine strategies, uh, what folks call structured equity. Um, in a perpetual low interest rate environment, what we've seen a lot of uh, investors do is attempt to extract yield from alternative assets, whereas before they were just looking at them strictly as, as uh, uh, an equity play. So yes, there's, there's definitely limited partner investors that are, are seeking yield, seeking income type plays uh, from alternative assets. And, and frankly, the number of, of options that are there um, as uh, um, uh, non-bank institutions have created strategies and products and offerings to fill, to fill the void that's been left by a lot of the banking institutions um, and as, as limited partners are, are seeking that yield uh, in non-traditional places, you're definitely seeing uh, more interest and more opportunity um, in that in that segment of the market. Nada asks, what are the biggest challenges for LPs in regards to making energy investments today? Well, uh, you know, everyone knows what's what's happened in the energy markets over the past few years, or really in the past uh, 18 months. Um, and so what we've seen from investors well, well let, let me back up a little bit. What we saw last year is investors saying, gosh, I, you know, I don't know if I can uh, sign up for you know, uh, U.S. production or U.S. oil field services uh, it, if it's going to take us you know, five to ten years to get out of the slump. Um, generally, investors recognize that um, energy is, is uh, cyclical, that prices go up, prices go down, and that if you're talking about a ten-year lockup, you really can't market time that. That said, uh, when the bottom was was really falling out, um, you know, folks were looking at that and saying, "Are there going to be opportunities here in in the U.S. Um, on the production side?" Um, and then, uh, along with that, if you're looking to uh, take a position on the recovery and its its time timing and speed and and whatnot. There were other ways outside of um, uh, alternative assets to to do that. Um, you know, you could you could make plays directly in the public markets, um, and so we really did see a lot of interest uh, dry up uh, over the last year. That said, I think, and I would expect that that over the next 24 months, um, uh, that there's going to be uh, great buy opportunities in the U.S. And as soon as um, uh, investors start to to prove that uh, and prove that out, uh, then you're going to see you're going to see uh, limited partners start to come back a little bit more. But th definitely, there's still some caution. Yeah, maybe doing some rescue funds with uh, oil services. Yep. Uh, Joe asks, does Harkin work on funds that are 50 million to 100 million, and how are smaller funds viewed these days? And who are the typical LP targets for small funds? Yeah, that's a great question. We definitely do. We've worked with uh, uh, funds under 100 million. We've also done top-off assignments where the fund might be greater than 100 million, but the, the fundraise potential for Harkin uh, is 50 million or less. 
uh, you know, we love small funds, particularly when you're talking about venture strategies, um, because those are harder to scale than, than potentially buyout strategies. So um, we do work with, with funds of those type. Uh, the kind of implied in the question is it's a different limited partner uh, uh, set that you're talking about, and that's absolutely, absolutely the case. If you're talking about the investment advisors who need to bring three or four clients into a fund, uh, bringing them in, you know, finding a sub hundred million dollar fund, it's, it's just challenging for them. So you're generally not talking to as many advisors. You're certainly not talking to the public pensions. Uh, um, and generally, we don't, we don't do much work with the public pensions that have to put you know, $100 million into a fund anyway. Uh, but that's certainly not part of your prospect pool. And then some of the larger endowments and foundations that have to write uh, 40 to $50 million minimum check sizes, uh, they're, they're not going to be there uh, as well. So you have a smaller pool, which is fine. Um, you don't, uh, you know, a group like Harkin, we're not going to be looking for a mandate where um, it's uh, can call everyone in the limited partner community and everyone's going to be, you know, it's going to be within everyone's uh, focus area. Um, so you really are talking about family offices. You're talking about smaller uh, advisors. You're talking about fund of funds um, quite often, um, uh, and those have been been an increasingly important part of the limited partner community again over the last five years. Uh, and then you're talking about smaller endowments and foundations. Scott, we're about out of time, but Sean just popped in a, a question I just have to ask. Uh, have you seen firms using a short three to five minute video and would that be effective in terms of marketing? That's a great question. That's one that we talk about all the time. Um, there. I, we have seen that. We've had a client who actually had uh, embedded in their presentation some videos, some testimonials from uh, uh, their portfolio uh, CEOs. Um, I would say that, w that we have a little bit of hesitance just in that if you get too far ahead of the curve on the marketing, it can appear gimmicky and sometimes can be seen as, uh, you know, uh, an attempt to um, excel based on uh, marketing gimmick as opposed to uh, you know just what the, uh, um, the the fundamentals of the fund. I think it's going to be increasingly part of what um, limited what general partners do to have effective presentations. Um, but you know with uh, with the, the the funds that we've been marketing, we've been you know, hesitant to be kind of first movers in that um, in that arena. Um, I will say that uh, you know we have a very strong bias towards in-person meetings as opposed to phone calls. Um, and you know, just one quick example I'll talk about. I uh, did a phone call with uh, introductory phone call with a limited partner. Um, didn't get really any follow-up, and then six months later. Uh, they called me up and said, hey, we're looking for a fund in this, uh, of this type. Have you guys seen anything? And then I said, well, yeah, you know, we had a phone call six months ago. And they had, uh, you know, they'd completely forgotten about the phone call. Uh, so um, you know, it is worth that time and expense to, to actually travel out and meet, meet folks. And you're, in my opinion, always going to get the best bang for the buck by having that um, in-person conversation where you can pitch yourself face to face. Well, Scott, this has been great. Thank you so, so much. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you, guys, Alan. Appreciate it. So if you have any questions about Harkin, Scott Holly is your man. He can help you. His contact information is up on the screen. If you have questions about Navitar, let me know. We've got a lot going on, a London office that's just opened. Later today, we're announcing an investment solution, and that's added onto our platform that serves capital markets from hedge funds to private equity, fund of funds, PERE, M&A, and much more, now including service for LPs. Thanks to all of you for joining the webinar today. Thanks also to Cindy Chow, who leads our marketing department for organizing and planning this webinar. And thanks to Kate and Konkar for showing us how you can leverage technology to achieve what Scott was talking about. So depending on your time zone, I want to wish you a great evening or a great day. Thank you all so much.